Hey, hey no. what's up? Timmy. How's it going, it. bud? Let me, let me tell you something. I was sitting here on my side of the camera, just really just staring into this screen, just <laughs> waiting. I'm like, is Jimmy going to show up? Is Jimmy going to show up? I know. I know Jimmy's going to be there. I'm going to show. I'm, I'm showing up. I'm showing up for you. No, I, and I just, uh, just added some volume because I just, you know what? As I said before, when we were kind of talking on our, on our pre-call, that I'm just so ever grateful to, to be able to speak to you. Um, I think there's nobody better in this world that is situated, not medically oriented, to kind of just give people some insights into like what what someone goes through when you kind of sit by yourself. <laughs> um, and I, I love the the National Geographic um, title. I said like the art of chill. Right? There's nobody <laughs> out there that has that greater chill factor than Jimmy Chin. And I don't, I don't want to keep belaboring this, but, you know, I remember when I first met you and all I wanted to do was carry your bags, you know, all, <laughs> I, know. all I wanted you to do is carry your job. bags and just walk up a mountain and just see the world from your perspective, because there's not that many people that have essentially been on almost every continent. You know, there's really no mountain high enough, right? You know, whether we're talking about Nepal, whether they're talking about Greenland, whether they're talking about Pakistan, um, Argentina, um, Antarctica. I mean, you've been essentially everywhere. Um, and you, you got Academy Award for Free Solo. I mean, one of the greatest movies that I've ever seen. One that from, from every moment, my heart just like was beating. It was like, <laughs> it was this pulse of, of, of blood that was running through my body because I, I can't believe it. I'm watching a, I'm watching a movie. By the way, for those that don't no, like I know Alex Honnold too. I got a chance to interview him. And he's a different type of guy. And those that scientifically understand, like he has no fear. He laughs at fear. But there's a guy that was behind the camera that was following each and every part. And that's, that's Jimmy Chen. So thank you for joining us, Jimmy. It's my pleasure. And, and I'm, you know, it's been great to know you over the years. You're talking about how your heart's pumping and your blood's pumping. I think that's your regular, <laughs> you're, you're pretty amped all the time. And I, when you said that you wanted to carry my bag pack and stuff up the mountain, I do remember thinking, wow, he could carry a lot of weight. <laughs> <laughs> He's pretty healthy looking guy. <laughs> well, I will tell you in preparation for our conversation, I got out and I ran, I ran a couple miles. Because I just wanted to, I just wanted to get, I just wanted to get it flowing, right? <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to feel what you you okay. feel. I mean, obviously, I'm at sea level here in Michigan, and you're in, in Jackson Hole at, at at altitude, so you, Jackson, Wyoming, you, you you deal with it all the time. But for those that are joining, thank you again, Jimmy. Um, remember, we're helping raise awareness around um, Give Together Now, and for those hashtag Give Together Now is a is a COVID response of 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 which we have the fortunate opportunity of really getting money into the hands of people that need it. And I just want to update everybody right now. We have raised close to just under $20 million, 20 million, close to $20 million. And that hasn't been that, this, that long. Right. And that affects the lives of 40,000 people, 40,000 people. And, um, I just want to say it's all because of everybody here on the channel, but it's also all because of um, great interviews and, and people that we've been able uh, to talk to along the way. So let's just let's just dive right into it, Jimmy. I, yeah. I just want you to unpack uh, unpack your your life, and I and I know you're not going stir crazy indoors because you're outdoors all the time. Yeah, that's true. I I do get outside a lot, but um, you know, one of the things I think is related to this conversation though is that. Uh, a lot of what I do and and when we are in isolation, one of the things that's really therapeutic and good for you and good for everybody else is thinking about how you can better the situation for the people around you. And I think that that's really incredible what you're doing, what Stand Together is doing, and if I can contribute in any way to help make someone's life just a little bit better, even if it's just one person or one family, um, that's, that's extremely meaningful to me. And 
Uh, I hope that other people take the opportunity in this moment if they have the resources and the capacity and they are in a place to help others. And, you know, I mean, that's the least we can do right now. So, yeah. And anyways. No, but I mean, that's exactly what we talk about at Stand Together. You know, how do we lift the rest of the communities up? How do we come better um, by, by joining forces and creating those win-win scenarios? Um, what, what's, the, what's the strangest thing you've, you've been doing in, in isolation? Because I, I know even though you spend time on the sides of mountains and you're dealing with different squalls, yeah. and for those people who don't know what a squall is, that's called a storm, and you're hanging by a rope, uh, like what's the strangest thing you've done during self isolation well you know what's funny is that like my day-to-day -day normal life is probably considered strange and weird to other people like hanging off a wall or climbing up a mountain <laughs> skiing down it that's my normal day-to-day -day. so like the strangest things for me actually are uh just being home for this many days in a row like i've been <laughs> for a little over a month, which is probably the most days that I've spent consecutively here in Jackson in five, maybe at least five years or longer. Um, and so I think like more of the mundane things that I've been doing at home for me feel <laughs> it kind of extraordinary. Like I cleaned out my garage. <laughs> yes. Um, and yes. I've been cooking and I've been cleaning. And I mean, those are, those are things I do on expeditions and stuff, but um, it's, it's, it's funny because it is more the mundane things that I think the day-to-day -day things that I don't normally get to do. I actually, I, right. I loved cleaning out my garage. <laughs> it wasn't a terrible thing. Um, but I mean, in general, I've been trying to keep things you know a, a routine and staying fit you know training for me is like a huge form of therapy um i always you know when i feel productive uh whether that's training or that's cleaning the garage or having some tasks or um you know ideally doing things that are you know making things better for my kids or my family um for others uh but yeah, I don't know if I do anything too crazy or strange. I mean, I think if you saw some of my like training regimen, you'd be like, what is that guy doing? But um, <laughs> you know. Well, maybe, maybe next time, maybe next time uh, I get a chance to interview you, you can kind of flip the script and you can take me through your training regimen because, you know, although I might've gotten out and I was able to run a couple miles, you know, with a mask on, just trying to like suck the oxygen out of me so I could just like strain myself. I, I, I bet, yeah, I, I know you're looking at that mat. I know you got a couple of like crampons and a couple other things that you might want to exercise and a couple pull-ups for me, but you know. Yeah. I, I think I can keep up, we'll, we'll save that for the next one. The and next I'll say, one. you know, I'm in a similar situation. I haven't been home for 20 years. Yeah. I haven't been home for 20 years. Think, I, I, I completely understand what you're talking about. Yeah. 20 years of being on the road, it's it's hard. It's it's a complete adjustment. It's like you're going through a little bit of a withdrawal because like I love looking at the memes of the the people that are sitting next to their washing machine and they're looking out the window through the washing machine. It's an iPad of like an airplane wing <laughs> or someone was on a treadmill <laughs> and they were acting like that was like the the um the walkway in the airport <laughs> yeah <laughs> the funniest things in the world i that's you know so i can uh completely um yeah. identify with what you're talking about but you know one of the things that we talk about at stand together it, it are these unique gifts and you have so many of them um and you know being a being a mountaineer and being a, a climber that wasn't necessarily the path that you you started on and it no. may not have been the path that your parents wanted you to follow at the very beginning no no, um, no. I, I mean I grew up in Mankato Minnesota which is basically like the, one of the flattest places in the U.S. Um, and fairly rural uh, and then my on top of that my parents were Chinese immigrants so mm -hmm. it, it was a it was a kind of a strange mix of identities um, to end up 
becoming a climber. It's not like my family had any history of climbing or being in the mountains. Um, so, but I grew up, uh, you know, pursuing a lot of different things. Like my parents were very kind of stereotypical um, immigrant parents. You know, obviously they came here to try to build a, a good life for their family mm -hmm. um, and had very high expectations of, of me to do well. Uh, and I, you know, started playing the violin when I was three and I, I studied martial arts from as long as I could remember. Um, and I swam competitively, f you know, for many, many years. So there was this kind of sense of training and um, excellence and, you know, constantly trying to learn and better a craft or a musical instrument or, um, you know, some sort of physical sport. So that was kind of built in. There's right. undoubtedly, you know, I took a lot of those lessons from growing up that I've applied through my entire life, which is, I think they were very, very useful, mm -hmm. but they never felt like they were mine. You know, um, I didn't really necessarily relate, like I wasn't passionate about them. I, I did it and I, and I tried hard and I trained hard and I wanted to be really, really good. And, and um, but, you know, it wasn't until I found skiing and, and much later climbing where, you know, these were things that felt like they were mine. They were things that I loved. Right, to do. right. Um, and you don't really necessarily identify consciously, you know, you're not like, this is the thing I'm passionate about. It's just one of those things where you can't not do it because you love right. it so much. Um, and so I, 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 I went to college, I finished school. Uh, I think there were a lot of expectations for my family. And I mean, kind of society too, you know, there's kind of a traditional path that some people um, have preconceived notions of and that's follow your career, you know, get a, get a really solid professional career. Uh, me growing up, it was, you know, my parents were all about, you know, you could be a lawyer or doctor or go into finance, you know, I thought there were three jobs in the entire world. Um, they had they had to put a lot of pressure on your shoulders. Yeah, there was a lot of pressure for for me to kind of you know have a traditional career path, which I understand because parents just want you to. You well, know, they just want they just want you to they just want you to be your your best. Yeah, you know? and they and, want and you to be able they, to take care of yourself. And, and they like, and they see one thing in yeah. you in order to kind of give you these these tools. And when I when I thought about talking to you, I kind of pictured this entire mountain of which you've been able to climb up but your parents gave you the ability to fly down but it was the foundation that you're talking about yeah. that really gave you those gifts and without a foundation the mountain could not no. reach that level of which it is today especially now that i'm a parent you know it is about like the foundation that you build for your kids, I think, um, to be good people, to try hard, work hard, you know, to have aspirations. Um, I think generationally, like probably my parents, your parents, they come from a period when um, there was a little bit, there, there were more kind of like guardrails that people assumed you had to stay within. And, right. um, you know, so there's so many more non-traditional kind of freelance work these days than there was, you know, however many years ago. So, you know, I understood that, or I understand that now. At the time, it felt very difficult because, you know, I was filled with a lot of doubt. And, you know, I think a lot of the, there's um, a misperception when people look at my career now where they think, oh, he must have known exactly what he was going to do this whole time. And he just went after it and made it happen. Um, and it wasn't necessarily like that. I mean, I, I wasn't sure what I was going to do. I didn't understand how I was going to be able to live this life that I wanted to live because you don't really necessarily climb or ski to become famous or make money. There's, there's much better ways to, to make money. Um, and so, uh, that was a struggle for many, many years, um, trying to figure that out and, and see if I could, 
if I could make it work. Uh, and so, you know, I but tell this story a lot, but people often ask me like, what's the greatest risk you've ever taken? Right. You know, was it climbing Everest and skiing Everest or was it climbing? And easily the biggest risk I ever took was not, you know, following this path right. that other people expected of me. Um, and I think that that's really hard for people to do, you know, when there's a lot of expectations and you're brought up with a lot of expectations. Yeah, that, that, that just points towards, again, something that we think about from Stand Together. Um, a lot of times those unique gifts are uh, reinforced or they populate themselves because of something that someone has given to you, right? And you know, just hearing the story about your relationship with your mother, the relationship uh, with your uh, with your father, um, and your and your upbringing, they gave gave that foundation that allowed that those unique gifts to percolate to the top. Um, even though they might have been, you know, your mom. You talked about your mom being a Jedi master. My mom was a Jedi master too. <laughs> I will tell you that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I I love the story you told me you know, that you said, and this is in a podcast, Drifter podcast when you were talking about how your mom said to you and i i don't want to i don't want to tell people you tell everybody what your mom told you um if you were going to go down this path yeah well i mean what did your mom said, say she she basically said okay fine if you want to be a you know climber and and mountaineer uh that's okay so long as you promise me that you don't die before me and that was and i thought I knew she's like, just promise me that. And I just, I remember thinking, oh man, that is such a Jedi move because I had to say, of course I will. Um, I promise you that. But it really, there were so many moments in my career where that was a deciding factor in the yeah. mountains. And I thought- Because you could have made a bad decision. Yeah, I mean, you're, you know, for the kind of things that, I was pursuing and still occasionally pursue, but you're, you're really pushing, trying to push the edge of what's possible, what you think is possible for yourself. Um, and there's a gray area in that where that margin becomes really, really thin at the edge, you know, mm -hmm. between making the right decision and the wrong decision or taking one extra risk in order to achieve something or not to take that risk in order to be able to come back and try again, you know? Right. And so um, there have there've been a lot of moments uh, that stand out where I thought, okay, well, you know what? I, I probably should, this is probably the part where we need to turn around. Like this is, this is riding that edge um, a little too close. So it worked. <laughs> you know what? Moms have a, a special way of knowing their children. And I yeah. think, um, she, she knows, she knows her child. And similarly, you know, yourself and while, while climbing became something that you aspired and a unique gift that you, um, were able to sort of foster photography was also, uh, another gift. Um, did you, did you feel as though, you know, you could just do it? Did you have to work at this gift? Um, wh where did photography where did photography come from? Because, you know, and, and in a couple of minutes, I'm going to, I'm going to just, we're going to do something a little different. I'm going to show a couple of your images, but just set us up with some of the photos that you've taken and set us up with like how photography came into your life. Yeah. I think I always had a creative impulse, you know, um, I drew a lot growing up. Um, and, I don't know. I, I think maybe I'm also wired like as a visual, you know, person um, where I, with the photography, when it came to me, when I first picked up a camera, it, it felt really natural, like in terms of composition and framing and, um, and I, I felt like it was a skill that I could really embrace because it, it satisfied a lot of different needs, you know, like I, it satisfied a creative need. It satisfied this need where, you know, I wanted to tell stories. 
um, I wasn't so much conscious of it, but I, I was really what was the kind of inspiration behind it was like, I was always surrounded, especially when I started climbing a lot and moving to Yosemite. And I was always surrounded by these like really extraordinary characters and uh, that I found really interesting and inspiring. And, um, and they thought in all these different ways too, you know, <laughs> like I, I was just like, wow, these people are amazing. And uh, I loved being able to share their stories. Yes. Uh, because I found them inspiring, you know, and so let me, so, let, me let me pause you right there because you're, you're talking about the very images that I want everybody to be able to see. Yeah. And I'm going to do something a little bit different. And, you know, our show obviously is based upon the foundation of these, um, uh, uh, what we call unique gifts, community, and helping others succeed. So these are, these are going to be three photographs, okay? Um, and that embody what we always talk about, right? One is going to be communities. You know, one, is, one is unique gifts. The, the second is community. And the other one is like succeeding by helping others succeed. So just talk through this photo, photograph right here sure. um, as it relates to, you know, your unique gifts. And I, I think one of the things is from Stand Together perspective is that's a perspective that only one person could essentially um, <laughs> grab. I know a few people that could do it because that's my peer group. But yes, I mean, this actually, this image is of one of my all time favorite, if not the most important uh, partner I've had in uh, the making of Free Solo and, and several of my um, big National Geographic assignments. This is my friend, Mikey Schaefer. And I took this image when we were in Morocco filming with Alex Honnold while he was training for uh, a Free Solo of El Cap. And Mikey here is hanging about 1,500 feet off the ground. On Wait, a, just tell people how far, how high 1,500 feet is. That's, that's uh, much. Yeah, well, uh, I think that's higher than the Empire State Building. Um, it's it's pretty high, and it's a sheer wall. And this is wait, moments, and let people know what sheer wall means. Means like, vertical or overhanging. Uh, and so nowhere to grab onto. Okay, well, everybody out there. there. You're not but, holding on like. Like your iPhone type of grips, <laughs> yeah. like you just I mean, kind of hold. Definitely holds here where there, Alex is. So Alex is going to need to hold on by like one fingertip at certain points. And this is a moment he, Alex is about to free solo this wall. Uh, and Mikey is getting ready to, to film. And I'm also filming. I snapped this photo right before uh, Alex was on the wall. And this is a classic moment you know, where there's a lot of tension because, you know, we're filming someone free soloing and when, you know, and not just somebody, but Alex, a very close friend. Uh, and, you know, there's not, there's no room for error. Like he can't make a single mistake or misstep at any given moment. Um, so there's a lot of tension, but there's also like, in some ways, you know, I can look at Mikey and think, okay, well, I have the best person in the world with me right now, especially for me, because we have a working relationship where there's so much trust. Mm -hmm. And we've been through a lot of moments like this before, where it kind of goes unstated, like, there's nothing to say, we both know what the stakes are, we both know what's going to go down, we both know that we also have to execute perfectly. Um, and there's a certain sense of, uh, well, there's a deep sense of appreciation and gratitude when you get to work with a teammate that you trust so yes. deeply. And yes. you know that they're gonna deliver and they're gonna put their best foot forward and that they're gonna handle this really intense situation with grace. Um, so so one, one of the things that we talk about standing together is succeeding by helping others succeed and so i'm gonna go to this photograph now yeah uh, because in the same way that you talked about alex and your and and your Mike. entire team 
you're helping them succeed. That's that's one of the most powerful things that you could do in this this world is not it's not only about you, but it's about the, those that are around you. So to talk about how um, you're helping others succeed in this picture. Well, this photo actually, I felt really guilty because my friend Conrad Inker, who is a great friend and um, one of the greatest mentors in my life, uh, is up there building this portal ledge, which is a hanging tent. We're on a wall. And this how many ropes? Like, Tell people how many ropes. Yeah, there's a bunch of ropes connecting our hanging tent. We're at, we're probably at eighteen thousand feet <laughs> wall in in northern India. And then my good friend Renan, Ozturk hanging down at the bottom and they're setting up the portal edge. And I had been helping set up, but then I, I climbed out left so I could take this, this photo um, of this moment. And I mean, in, in the strange way, uh, a photographer and an athlete, uh, especially professional athletes, it's a very symbiotic relationship because, you know, they know that I'm going to go take this photo. So they're going to keep building this tent, which I'm going to end up sleeping in. Yes. But they also understand that these photos are really, you know, documentation of this like incredible moment. And, you know, it's, it's these kinds of images that help continue to propel like an athlete's career and, and the longevity of their career. So that's right. very symbiotic. And, and create that win-win scenario because yeah they know that you're out there helping their image and creating this this moment which therefore yeah. drives the community and this goes into the next question this next picture um of those that are around you so speak to some of the people that you've met in the and this image and then and then we'll get back into some some more questions but i just love your your iconic imagery and yeah. the awards that you've gotten speak for themselves well, thank you. But I love that you grabbed this image um, because not a lot of people would grab this image. It's not like some sort of iconic, crazy climbing shot. This is my uh, part of my free solo uh, production team on top of El Cap. Uh, we just finished filming Alex up high training and we're playing a game of bananagrams on our sleeping pad. <laughs> but... Uh, that's just the context of the moment. So we spent yeah. the entire day, maybe six to eight hours hanging in ropes, filming and shooting. And um, and at the end of the day, we just finished making dinner and, and here we are like having a good time. And Alex is obviously hanging out. But the reason why this photo is actually important for me is because, you know, a lot of people think about Free Solo and Alex, a single individual that climbed this wall by himself. Mm. Um, but what people don't necessarily understand is that this, that whole film project, uh, and, and just the amount of rigging and the, the scene that was there in that production was, was really kind of like, uh, Alex's support crew. You know, we were yeah. all kind of there to kind of support Alex and try to help him achieve what he needed to achieve. Um, because like we helped rig ropes that he could train on and, and we carried gear and equipment and food and water, you know, just to all kind of support him in his endeavor to be able to do this, even though we were considered the production team filming it, it was really a big community effort, um, from the production with Alex. And, and I think Alex would, would probably, um, agree that that that, that made a difference um, well hopefully it, yeah well ho hopefully um alex will will log on at, at, at some point and get give give you a shout out i i, te I texted him earlier but you know alex you know he's not a, well now with his relationship right he's now yeah. more connected to the world where before he might have not had so much technology around him yeah and i just want to uh again let everybody know that you know these subject matters and these nuggets of of life that jimmy is is giving you is so that you know while we go through this period of isolation um during covid 19 we're raising money uh to give together now.org give together now.org 
um, where we've raised close to $20 million. And, you know, 100% of this money goes to help other people, right? And um, we've raised a lot and 40,000 families are going to be affected. So I just want to make sure everybody knew. And, and for those that are joining, you know, Jimmy Chen speaks for himself, right? Um, the, the award... I can't believe Academy Award. I, I, I saw you on the stage. That was the most amazing moment. It's like, I know that guy. I know that guy. Um, yeah. So uh, one of the things That's that you do through your, through your iconic imagery is you really uh, create empathy for the subjects. And I think that was related to those, those pictures that you had. Um, you know, why, is, why is that not only important, um, not just in films, but, but really in everyday life? Yeah. Well, I'll speak to the first part. Uh, you know, a lot of the stories that I tell or that I've sought to tell have been about human potential and the human spirit. And, you know, the world that I know um, has a lot of that. You know, there's like, mm -hmm. there's so much, you know, um, of people trying to do their best to try hard to dream the impossible dream to achieve but you know it, it, because i think of my background having come up with all these different sports and a lot of different life experiences i i knew that it doesn't matter what world that you come from but that we're all human and that we yes. all have these very very similar aspirations and traits and characteristics and so it's been interesting because i've used climbing and mountaineering and these these made these two films and a lot of the photography that i shoot of these kind of like outrageous unimaginable situations that people are like there's no way i would ever do that there's no way i could ever relate to these people but then when you show the human side of these people that are doing these kind of what people consider outrageous things, I think it strikes even deeper that there people can have empathy because they think, wow, mm. at the end of the day, we're all alike. Um, mm. even, even people who we might, you know, consider so far out of our realm of understanding or so far out of our circle of friends or communities, you know, that, um, that is a big part of the storytelling that I, and, and big part of the reason I wanted to tell those stories was to show, because at the end it is so much about um, that empathy and relatability to, to, characters that you wouldn't normally think are relatable to. So, you know, like Meru was a lot about friendship and was yes. a lot about mentorship and was a lot about, um, you know, enduring hardship together. And I think those universal themes are themes that everybody can relate to. Well, I think there's a, a another, just as you talked about, and by the way, um, uh, Chris um, Burkhardt is in, in the room. So he's, He's in there giving you a shout out. I just wanted to make sure I, I, I gave him a shout out as well. Yeah. Um, but there's, there's a lot of people um, that are, are sitting, in, sitting in their own room, you know, um, and they all feel the same, it's the same way, right? And I think, and, and, that, and that's this notion of the community, right? And we talk about that from Stand Together. We're, we're, we're at our best when we lift each other up. And so, um, but just kind of switching gears into this notion of community, I, I want to talk about the art of, like you talk about the art of being alone, right? Or I actually talked to you about it and I said, you know, freedom and isolation, right? Some people feel as though that, um, some people feel as though they're trapped in isolation, but you thrive within isolation um, when there's no one around, there's no distractions, you know, w w what's that like? And how are you able to flip that moment from one of panic to one where you can essentially thrive? Yeah, I mean, I think that, 
there's probably varying degrees of, of what you're talking about. There's more kind of acute situations in which you have to kind of manage a situ like a crisis that has a timeline that you have to make hard decisions quickly. Uh, there's that, but there's also more of the kind of, which would be like you're on the mountain, there's a huge storm coming and you have to decide if you have, are you going up or down. Um, or not go any, or not go anywhere at all. Or not go anywhere. It's just like the storm's coming in. You might be eight, you know, eighteen hundred feet up in the air on a, a couple ropes, yeah. and and you can't go anywhere. You can't go down. You can't go up. You might just get stuck there. But by, by yes. the way, how long? What's the longest amount of time you've been stuck on the side of a mountain, not being able to go anywhere and just eat straight sardines? <laughs> well, sardines would be a luxury, actually. <laughs> Uh, probably five or six days, I think, I've been stuck in the Port Ledge. But, you know, I've been stuck at base camps longer. Um, and I think that that's kind of like the further end, like what we're experiencing now is where we're kind of stuck indefinitely in quarantine, you know. Yes. We don't really have enough information to know when, you know, we can, like, be a hundred percent sure where we, we we can safely you know leave quarantine or safe safely leave quarantine for others too you know i mean a lot of this is we're doing this not just for ourselves but for the for the entire community that's why we're we're um staying at home but uh you know i always think that opportunity comes in very you know comes in a lot of different strange moments or vehicles you know and and i think that when um as the saying goes when one door closes another opens and yes and it is about embracing the things that you can do right now as opposed to maybe wallowing in self-pity about the things that you can't do you know it, 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 it and and i think that that process of um just that process of thinking is useful just being like okay well okay i I can think about all the things that I can't do, but you know, I should just set that aside because I can't do them. But what are the things that I can do? What are things that I can do to better myself, to be productive, to feel useful? Um, which brings me back to our original conversation at the beginning, which is you know, one of the things that you can do is look to how you can uh, make things better for the people around you. Mm. Um, and, and that's, in you know that 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 is important for others but it's also in some ways selfish too because it's not selfish but it's 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 also good for you it's a win-win situation because feeling useful and productive is a huge way through this isolation um and i think you know the, and there's also opportunities to better yourself so on that, the opposite so on the opposite side you have, you know, your individual time, but then you also have your expeditions. Um, so what can you learn from the, the lessons and, and the adventures and, and missions with other people? Uh, in terms of like, well, some, like here, here's the thing. Sometimes you're out there by yourself, but other times you have unique personalities and not everybody is essentially getting <laughs> along, right? So, you know, how do you, how do you get through those, those moments? Because there's people sitting in their houses right now and, they're at home for the first time in 20 years and they have yeah. to find a way in order you know, to, to make it through. So I, give, I, me so, give I, us I some advice. You, right? you know, this, this, this teamwork, things great. like that. Great. So, so I was very, in my early 20s, I was an instructor at the National uh, Outdoor Leadership School, NULS. And, you know, they run a lot of expedition programs on how to, um, not just survive, but excel in expedition kind of, uh, wilderness environments. Uh, it's a lot about leadership, and and um, and I'm now on the board of of Knowles. But one of the things that we always talked about was expedition behavior, and we even short it even had like an EB. It had its own acronym. expedition behavior, like good expedition behavior. It's not it's not uh, rocket science. It's like good expedition behavior is how you handle your interactions with your you know expedition partners going to get all the water for the team helping someone else out of their tent when you're done setting up your tent keeping all your 
you know, stuff together tight. So like if a storm comes in, it doesn't all blow away or get covered in snow and disappear. You know, I mean, they're, it's like good expedition behavior <laughs> is not, are the things, you know, but it's a nice term because you can remind yourself and think, is this good expedition behavior? You know, like, so what, am I handling so what, this in a good way? Right. So what we need is um, good quarantine behavior. behavior right? Yeah. Good quarantine behavior means that when you wake up in the morning, maybe you make the bed. Yeah. Maybe you put the dishes away. Yeah. Maybe you do something for your maybe family, you for your partner. for your housemates. Right. Maybe you make the coffee. These are... <laughs> Good quarantine behavior. You know what? I just I think I just gave you a good idea in order to kind of write a write a book, right? <laughs> the quarantine life, good quarantine behavior uh, by Jimmy Chin. Uh, I think people would definitely appreciate that. I think the community uh, of staying together would would definitely yeah. appreciate that as well. Um, uh, you, you talked about and you mentioned doing things for the community. Um, I wanted to just say this um we've been doing something for the community obviously for stand together and give together now um here's a quote from one of the families that we've helped out so a lot of people on the other side might be asking the question or they've asked uh, through several interviews tell us about some of the stories about people and so diane um I'm just reading this because i'm just getting this message right now diane she's a single uh, widowed mom from chicago um, she had to stay at home to take care of her son once the school closed. Uh, her son is ADHD and needs her to be home. Um, there, there's, I know a lot of people are seeing videos of parents that for the first time, you know, are, are spending more time than they're, they're used to with their children. Some parents have to spend time with their kids. Um, so as a domestic worker, Diane, the pandemic made it made it impossible for her to safely work, take care of her son, and impact her ability to support her family. Um, and here's a note. I just wanted to give you some background on her, but here's a note from her. I was able to pay my rent, my light and gas bills, and put groceries in my house. No one ever did anything like this for me, ever. This is truly a blessing from God, and I'm forever grateful. Um, and that's, that's a real story about a, a real young lady that benefited from Gift Together Now, um, benefit from that $500 that so many people that are in this room um, have been able to support. And like I said, we're close to $20 million. Uh, so Jimmy, thank you so much for sharing some of those, those nuggets and, and the, uh, the quarantine behavior, I love that. So <laughs> we wanted to take a couple questions from the audience and uh, hopefully you'll like these. Um, Overland Tomorrow, Overland T T R W asked, "What impossible goal, Jimmy, do you wish you could achieve?" Oh man, um, I like I like this question. This is that's a, this is stretching because it's like, what impossible goal? What do you mean? Wait, first of all, Overland, there's nothing impossible for Jimmy. Jimmy can do anything. <laughs> Jimmy can go anywhere. Okay. The only limitation for Jimmy is his own mind. So I, I don't know. All right, what's what's impossible? I mean, impossible that's a goal? tough one. Uh, there's so many. I mean, I have I have aspirations to do so many different things. Um, they're personal goals, of course, uh, with my climbing or filmmaking or um, photography. But I mean, I think um, I don't know. That's a tough one. I mean, obviously, it would be it would be great to resolve like, um, you know, some of the bigger human issues that the the world faces: um, poverty and um, equal access to medical care. Um, you know, things that sometimes feel like they're impossible to achieve, uh, but you know, I, that's not something that. I, that's going to take a whole community of people to do, you know, and, and um, issues around climate change as well. So I think, yeah, it's a big, big topic, but of course, to reduce human suffering overall, I mean, is, is I guess something to aspire to. <laughs> so one of the things that we, we talk about from, from stand together, that's like one of the core, um, issues that matter most 
right? And you said it right then, they're poverty. Um, yeah. There's so many families that are out there um, that are affected um, not only by COVID-19, but just in life. And that's what we're, I, I just wanted to, that was just so spot on. And that's why we love having you um, on Stand Together Live today, because exactly what you're talking about, exactly what we together in a win-win scenario can, can do. Um, yeah. There's another question. I am PhD. I love these. I love these handles. <laughs> you know, like back yeah. in the day, my dad had a handle. His, his name was just Swift Swabby. I'm like, everybody now has a handle. Okay, um, Jimmy, what was the first mountain? What What's the first mountain you're going to climb once you know quarantine life um, is over? Uh, I don't know. I mean, and I'm I'll just... and wait, and I'll preface this by saying. Maybe it's a mountain, but then maybe metaphorically speaking, a mountain. I don't know, but I think people really want to know what mountain. Yeah, I mean, a physical, actual mountain will probably want be one of the mountains uh, near my home in Grand Teton National Park, um, which is closed. All the national parks are closed right now. But when it opens again, and because it's near home, and if I'm here, that's probably where I'll head up there. Um, but metaphorical, I mean there's plenty there's personal ones there there are things that i always feel like i can do to be a better person um uh where where i spend my time and bandwidth in terms of you know um the environment and politically and um and helping others so love that um is there is there any last couple of things words of advice nuggets of uh, solitude that you want to pass on to everybody else that's been able to spend some time here on Stand Together Live? Yeah, well, I mean, just thank you, everybody, for uh, checking in on this. Um, I mean, I think this is a really important cause uh, because it has very real and direct um, benefits to, to people. Uh, this is, I just think it's incredible what, what you're doing. Um, and what Stand Together is doing that, you know, that they're, people are actually just getting, getting money to, to survive this, this moment um, and linking people together so that we can all support each other, you know. Jimmy, thank you. Yes. I'm, I'm, you. I'm, I'm grateful to your time. I'm grateful to, to everybody else that's uh, been able to join us. Um, we hope everybody feels encouraged. Um, uh, give together now if you can um shout out hashtag give together now go to give together now.org um whether it's five dollars ten dollars it doesn't matter the amount of money there's a lot of families that are in need out there um there's a there's a link in stand together for give together now there's a link in jimmy's bio there's a bunch of stuff that's out there remember a hundred percent of the money goes to those families in need remember diane okay Remember the single widowed mother and her son who has ADHD and how she was able to pay her rent, her bills, and put food on her table. Um, that's what Jimmy's been talking about. Um, he's been talking about uh, poverty um, as, as being one of the biggest mountains that we can all uh, climb together. And Jimmy, through all your climbing, you've really brought everybody together. Um, and hopefully everybody will be able to get and see the his movie, Free Solo, with our friend Alex Honnold, um, who really kind of pushes the limits. But thank you again, Jimmy Chin, father, friend, climber, uh, expedition, National Geographic, North Face. I was a swimmer too, just want to let you know. <laughs> so we have we have Good more in common than, than you realize. I know, uh, the next time I'm going to interview you. You're coming. Are you coming back? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> if you need me, yeah. <laughs> oh yes, Jimmy. We always need you. This has been one of the best interviews, and 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 I'm like I said, I'm grateful. Um, so for everybody out there, stay. Um, you know, keep track of our Instagram channel. Stay up to date with announcements of our interviews for next week. Um, Jimmy Chen, thank you again. Um, I will talk to you soon. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Take it easy. Good All to right, see bye. you.